Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Welcome to everybody who's joining us here. We're just talking, we've just been in lockdown here, so we've come back together again. So we're mightily uh, grateful to be able to come face to face again. Uh, tonight we continue on with our series, The Journey to Faith. Uh, tonight's title is called Jesus, The Early Years. It's Lesson 94. And it's called The Early Years because like the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament where they talk about the 400 silent years we find in the early part of the story of Jesus that it's a little bit similar because we hear a lot about his birth and then we basically have a period of time where nothing happens until he's 12 and he's taken to the temple uh, would anyone like to hazard a guess why they mention when he's 12 being taken to the temple apart from the fact that his parents lost him right so he's actually come of age. And so there's a significance to why this is in the Bible. And there's actually something at that particular festival which you do when you come of age. Anyone know what a, a child who comes of age does at the temple in those times? They call the Bar Mitzvah. He reads the Torah. There's a reading, right? But there's something else that actually happens. What seals their covenant? If you were a Jewish person back in those times, when the temple was still there, what seals the covenants? Circumcision. Circumcision is definitely one, but that happened when he was eight days eight old days. and introduced yeah. to the temple. But what happens when he's 12? No, no. It's about sacrifice. You see, it's the first time that the boy, and it's a boy because the men do it, will actually perform a sacrifice. In other words, Jesus took an unblemished lamb in order for it to be sacrificed when he became a man under the law. Okay, And then from there, at age 12, what's the next time we hear about Jesus? When he's, as the Bible says, about 30 years old. And so we have this huge vacuum, 18-year gap, and then we pretty much have a 12 year or 10 to 12 year gap from the beginning of the narrative and so there's many many years where there's no story why do you think there's no story apart from what john says john says if we said everything about jesus we'd never finish writing but it's putting right that aside it's not the right time God's yeah it's not timing. really God's timing. right so he's still a yes he's a he's a boy yeah child. he's a child he's, he's a yeah child of the flesh and unlike his cousin John what's different between when John's born John the Baptist and when Jesus is born John was, John was older John was um, older correct John was full of the Holy Spirit from childhood right yeah. it was oh, Jesus oh, yeah. received the power of the Holy Spirit when he was baptized yeah. okay so you can see God's plan and the reason that John was actually filled with the Holy Spirit is because what was his job? Right. He was there to prepare the way of the Lord as the as we sing today with the uh, the worship song about Elijah. Mm -hmm. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And so his preparation for the way of the Lord wasn't about a set task at a set time. It was something that was incumbent upon him. Another question about John. Where did he grow up? We're going to cover this, but just a few questions to wake us all up tonight. Where did he grow up? Would it be in the temple because he is a Nazarene? No, he didn't grow up in the temple. Where did he grow up? Any thoughts? Where was his ministry? Somewhere we were. Right. A joke That's part of the area. So John was actually in the wilderness. Where? In the wilderness, as they say, or in the desert. So John is a boy who had the Holy Spirit given to him by the Lord at his birth. He had a function to fulfill. He was set aside by God. And he lived as a child in the wilderness on his own. How extraordinary. And so, once again, no glamorous picture. Right? He's not living in a dwelling. And so we find in the story, John does move around when his ministry happens later on. 
because John's ministry was also commissioned. So there was a point in time where even though John had received the Holy Spirit, he wasn't actually commissioned into his ministry until it was time, at a time that God chose, for that period of preparation or uh, <coughs> speaking out, proclaiming that the Lord was on his way. And so we're going to have a look at some of that tonight. One thing, funny mm. thing is that when the water turning into wine, Yes. Mary called for Jesus, so she would have known he would have been able to perform miracles. So I always thought she would have seen something in the past that would allow her to do It's something. interesting because she knew that he was the son of God, yeah. right? Uh, clearly for, for many reasons. But when he did that, he actually said to his mum, he said, oh, shucks, mum, please, I'm not ready yet. This yeah. isn't the time. Yeah. So in other words, this isn't something that the Lord called him to do. Something that mum said, well, since you're the Lord, could you just do me a favour? And so it was the first miraculous sign, funnily enough, wasn't it? But it wasn't intentional. And so we see the journey of real people in the real world at the same time as we see the Lord's plan being put into place. Now, the thing that's really key here, which we have to get over, is that Jesus is God. People use all these different ways of describing this and it can be really, really complicated. But at the end of the day, you have to accept, to understand the principle of this, that Jesus is God. And so we're going to have a little look at this as well. So I'm going to run through this in a brief um, way. I've got a chart for you with a sequence of events and we're also going to discuss where all of the different characters from the New Testament come from. So people like Caiaphas, the high priest, People like Pontius Pilate, they're all there. Who are they? Where do they come from? Who appointed them? Who appointed the high priest during the time of Jesus? Pharisees. No. No, I would have said it was the Roman Empire. Right. It was actually the Roman Emperor himself. Okay. And so today we learn that one of Herod's sons, Herod Archelaus, who was given a territory to rule, had it taken off him because of certain circumstances and it went under Roman rule. And so we're going to go through all the different prefects. So they're the, the governors, the Roman governors, and Pontius Pilate is actually the fifth one. Okay, so so it should be uh, fairly interesting. So, so as we get on the way, uh, first of all, we are following the genealogy of Jesus. When we go to the genealogy of Jesus from the periods of the kings we follow through the book of Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 to 17 and when we get right down to the end we come to this statement where it's no longer so and so the father of so and so mm. it's Joseph, Joseph husband of Mary doesn't say father of Jesus why because Jesus was God's son, God's son. Yeah. All right now the scriptures we read in the last lesson which we've had a week's gap because of the lockdown actually talks about how God became Jesus' father when he was born of the flesh. So it's a terminology, so please understand. The reason he's called father and son, right, is because the Holy Spirit was sent from the Lord who made Mary pregnant, right? So God was the father in that sense. The thing is that when we talk about a son, it's because he's born of the flesh. And so he's a son. So how would you work or understand if the father and the son didn't have a name to differentiate the two? It'd be very complicated to, uh, to uh, explain or to, to write about, in fact. And so the scriptures actually tell us that God became the father when Jesus was born of the flesh. Okay? There was no need for him to be father before that because Jesus wasn't born of the flesh. Remember that the word Jesus means God our Saviour. When they talked about him in the prophecies, they said that his name was Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. So that means God the Saviour came to be with us in the flesh when we put all of that picture together. So the understanding is that God and Jesus is one. Mm. 
okay? And so when Jesus is giving miraculous signs, he's basically saying, when you see me, you see the Father. He's not saying this because he's saying, I'm like my dad. He's saying, I am your dad. I'm here with you. And so we'd have to say what a privilege it was for those people to have God walking amongst them at that time. How frustrating it must have been for the Lord that people wouldn't believe that he was who he is, who he said he is. And so this is the circumstance. So the genealogy itself reflects this by saying, Joseph, husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Christ means, everyone remember? Christos, which means? Messiah. Messiah in Hebrew, which means, or Messiah in English, but Meshach in Hebrew. Christos, Christ, Messiah, Meshach, what does that word mean? The anointed one. Okay. So Jesus is the anointed one. When you read these scriptures from Isaiah, etc., it talks about the one and only. God is one. Jesus is God. And so that's where the, why the language varies when we read the scriptures. Okay, so obviously we're well and truly underway with the time of Jesus. Now the last map that I put up for you, this shows you the breakup of the land during this time of the New Testament. <clears throat> this pink area here, which is obviously the largest, represents three key areas, Samaria, Judea, and Idumea. The Idumeans were the Edomians or the Edomites that moved up during the time of Babylonian exile, who were forced to become Jewish people. And it's from this stock that Antipater came, and of course his son Herod, and the Herodian industry, uh, industry dynasty. Judea, of course, we all know as the former Judah. Samaria is the former capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. It was also called Samaria. And up here we have the Galilee, which is actually a separately ruled area. So when we start reading the New Testament, you keep hearing that they go from Judea to the Galilee. They go back to Judea and go back to the Galilee. They're actually going to two separately ruled territories. As I'm about to explain, Herod Archelaus, who is one of the sons of King Herod the Great, he becomes a ruler who has lots of issues and he becomes deemed incompetent and removed. And so he gets replaced by a Roman governor. Whereas Herod Antipas remains the ruler of the Galilee. Okay, so we have these shifts in what's happening. So on this next map, which is uh, provided for tonight, what we find is that these three territories remain the same overall territory, but their name gets changed to the province of Iudea, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And so it becomes one Roman province. So we've got the Roman province of Syria, of which this province is a sub-province. We have Herod Antipas ruling the Galilee as a member of the Herodian dynasty. We have this territory over here being ruled by the other brother, who's a half-brother, Herod II Philip. We've got the autonomous cities of the Decapolis. Perea is also ruled by Herod Antipas. And we have these two territories here, which is ruled by Herod's sister, Simone. These territories, she was actually deemed and gifted Ashkelon, but also this other territory, great trading area, lots of good taxes, so she earned her income and was very wealthy. And this other little grey area here that she rules, she actually had a plantation of date palms there. And the problem that we had is we had some corruption <coughs> going on because they were diverting the water of the Jordan to feed her date palms rather than where it was meant to be going to the farmers. So this is all of the different territories that are here. Okay, so getting underway with the notes. When Jesus is born in Bethlehem in 2 BC, the Roman Empire is ruled by Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus is the great nephew of Julius Caesar. Okay, so 
He, he is currently ruling at the time when Jesus is born. Judea is ruled as a vassal kingdom of Rome by King Herod the Great at this time. And Judea's king seeks to kill the newborn baby Jesus. So we've already covered this. So his father Joseph takes him to Egypt with Mary to protect him. After the death of Herod the Great in early 1 BC, they return to discover that Archelaus, the son of King Herod, now rules Judea as a king. And the Bible actually says that. They say that he reigns. He reigns Judah or Judea. So he's assumed the role of a king. And we'll come to this, but this is a problem. Afraid to go to Judea, Joseph settles once again with his family in Nazareth in the Galilee. A problem arises for Archelaus because he actually isn't approved to rule as a vassal king by the Roman emperor. He assumed that he's his daddy's son, I'll just take over and that's okay. But every ruler has to be appointed by the Roman emperor. And so he doesn't do this. So a problem rises for him. Uh, and his reign is filled with revolt and murder of many Jews who rally against his corrupt ways. So he's actually taking money from the temple. He's actually diverting resources for his own property, date farm as well, a date, date palm farm that he had as well. And he uses the army, the Roman army, as a tool, as a weapon to control the Jewish people. Now you've got to remember he's an Idumean. Okay, he's a descendant of the Igemeans. So he's actually uh, causing a lot of problems. And so the Jews actually revolt against him. And so he uses the army to put them back into their place. And as a consequence, he starts killing the Jewish people. And so they don't like him. So confronted by uh, Caesar Augustus, Herod Archelaus is allowed to govern the Jews as an ethnarch. So what's an ethnarch? It's not a king. What's an ethnarch? Think about the word eth. E T H. What does eth normally start off? Ethnarch sounds like eth. Nick. Okay, so if you say that someone's ethnic, you say that it's someone from a particular place, don't you? Right? And so Herod is there as an ethnic ruler. In other words, a ruler from that country. So in other words, he's not a Roman. And so he's deemed then ethnarch. And so he is allowed to rule as an ethnarch, but not a king. So in other words, he's lost those rights. Whereas his father and his father, father called themselves the king of the Jews. And it was actually sanctioned by the Romans. But in AD 6, he's deemed incompetent. And the Roman emperor decides to combine Samaria, Judea and Idumea into one province called Idumea and place his own prefect or Roman governor to rule and his name is called Caponius. And so I'm going to put up a chart now uh, in full and then I'm going to put it up into two halves so you can see it a bit better. This chart uh, is something of a lot of work that I've put in to create. There's nothing that I could find anything like this. So what we do is we go from the time of the birth of Christ in this chart through to the time of John the Baptist when he baptizes Jesus to commission his ministry. In between all of these years, there's a whole range of activities that happen, which as I mentioned, aren't mentioned in the Bible, a lot of them. And yet some of the characters are certainly people within the Bible. So on this bottom part of the chart in pink, we've got a couple of years in BC, and then from the green band going up uh, and then into the blue band, we have the change of two Roman emperors and we're in AD. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go to the next screen so it's in a much larger size and I'm sure you'll be able to read it a lot more clearly. So starting off in 2 BC, we mentioned that we have the birth of Jesus. In 1 BC, King Herod dies between January and April and his son Archelaus that we're talking about rules Samaria, Judea and Idumea as a king, even though his appointment isn't approved by the Roman emperor. Now after this, we have five years that pass in which there's nothing 
historical that actually changes and there's nothing biblical to report. However, during this time, this is when I mentioned that the reign of Herod Archelaus is marred with revolt, corruption and murder. And as an unofficial king, he's deposed. Jesus took, uh, sorry, Joseph took Jesus to Nazareth in the Galilee when he returned from Egypt. Because it says in Matthew 2.22, he was afraid to go to Judea. The reason he was afraid to go to Judea, as I've just explained, was the ruler was corrupt. He was using the Roman army to suppress revolt. And people were uh, living a life of oppression underneath this king. And so he didn't want to go back here. When we get up to here in 6 AD, we suddenly get a range of activity. First one here, Publius Sulpicius Quirinius. Anyone recognize that name? Quirinius? It's in your Bible. Quirinius was the governor of Syria who was appointed to take a census. Okay, I'm going to come to it in a minute. So he's appointed to uh, the governor of Syria to take a census. Herod Archelaus is deposed and the first Roman prefect or procurator as they're called formally, Caponius, is appointed over, over the province of Iduea. So this is a new province that's formed, as I've mentioned on the map, joining Samaria, Judea and Idumea into one nation, one country. You notice in the Bible, this name Idoea that the Romans use is never mentioned. It always says everybody's going back and forth from Judea and up to Galilee. Why? Because Jesus has grown up in the Galilee. Most of his ministries in the Galilee. His disciples come from the Galilee. Some of his, a lot of his miracles are in the Galilee. But it tells about how he goes up and down and up and down to Judea. Why is he going to Judea? What's in Judea? What's the big event in Judea? Passover. It's, Passover is one of the things. Where does it happen? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. And what's in Jerusalem? The temple. And so we see that this is journeying back and forth and back and forth. Okay, so I'll come back to that as I uh, continue on now. So in AD 6, as the new province of Idoea comes under direct Roman administration, Publius Sulpicius Quirinius is actually a Roman aristocrat. Now he's also known as Cyrenius, and this is what he's actually called in Josephus, the Jewish historian's writings, so we can identify who he is. And he's appointed the governor of Syria by Caesar Augustus. Quirinius is instructed to assess the province of Iduea for taxation purposes. So he imposes a census on the Jews. So think about it. We've just taken over this territory. It's been ruled by an independent ruler. No one really knows what's going on. He was corrupt. And so the emperor says, OK, I'm appointing you the governor over Syria. I'm going to appoint a prefect to be the local governor over what's called I do I can never pronounce this word. Uh, how do you how do you think you should say it? I've got no idea. I no idea. <laughs> <laughs> very very good. So that place, that's right. So he's appointed the local governor underneath him. So in other words, it's a sub province of Syria. So ultimately, the governor of Syria is over or responsible for the province of Idumea. So what we find there is the Roman Emperor says, well, we want to know what's going on down there. So we want you to take a census. Why do we take a census? We just, we just did one here last night in Australia. Why do we do a census? To see what the population is and what they're doing. Right. And they talk about what do you earn as well. Right. The biggest, most interesting fact for the Roman Empire is how much taxes are we going to get from these people? How much are they earning and how much can we tax them? If you actually remember and you look at a lot of the scriptures, you'll find that one of the complaints of the Jewish people is always about taxes. Who did they hate the most? Tax collectors. Why? Because not only did they collect for the gut for the Roman Empire, but if they could accrue a bit on the side, the Roman Empire said, eh, it doesn't matter as long as you give us ours. And so most of them did this and they were corrupt as well. 
who's a tax collector who followed Jesus and became a disciple? Matthew. And so the other disciples didn't like Matthew very much. Right? So we see some of these stories sort of coming to life through this situation. So under the authority of Quirinius, this sub-province is asked to have a census. So the Jewish historian Josephus says in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews, So Archelaus's country was laid to the province of Syria, and Cyrenius, which is Quirinius, one that had been consul, was sent by Caesar to take account of people's effects in Syria and to sell the house of Archelaus. So in other words, they're taking over. You know, you're out, somebody else is in. You're selling the house. Somebody else is buying. So a census, however, how do you think that goes down in Jewish law? Does anyone know anything about censuses and Jewish law? Is it okay or isn't it okay? No. No. If it's a guess, it's a good guess. No, <laughs> but, it's because, was it... Uh... David took one and God was really angry with him. Right, well done. Fantastic, that's exactly right. right. God was angry with him. God doesn't need a census. God knows. He doesn't need a census. And so he asked man not to take a census of other men. And so when this uh, census is imposed on them, it's forbidden under Jewish law and the Jews resent the imposition of being assessed so what do they, they do? What they often do best, they like to revolt. And so they stand up against it. So at first, an open revolt is prevented by a priest called Joazar, who's the current high priest at that time. But a Jewish leader called Judas of Galilee, or Judas of Gamala, leads a resistance movement that in turn leads to the formation of what Josephus, uh, the historian, calls the Fourth Party. Now, the Fourth Party become known as the Zealots. So this is the origin of the Zealots. Right? They're called Zealots, why? Because he actually called them to arms. What did, the, what did the Zealots do? They believed in assassinating those who were oppressing them. Right? Who was the Zealot in Jesus' disciples? What's his name? Anyone remember? Saul. So. No. No, it's that sound? They called him Boanerges, the Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. Yeah, he was always, he was always, they show him in the yeah. Chosen do his karate practice. Yeah. <laughs> he must have some Asian influence. In the Bible, Boanerges, Sons right. of Thunder. So his name is actually Simon. Yes. So he's another Simon. Mm. So that's why the other Simon was called Simon Peter, because it differentiates between the two Simons. Okay? So. So his name was actually Simon. So who's the first three political parties? If the fourth that Josephus says is the Zealots, who's the other three? You know what they are? We've talked about them. Pharisees, Pharisees Sadducees, Sadducees, and the Essenes. Okay? So the Essenes were a sect of people who removed themselves predominantly from Jerusalem. Men only. It was a men's shed. No women were allowed. They went there to separate themselves from everything that was of the flesh. And so they isolated themselves by the side of the Dead Sea, and we'll be talking about this uh, shortly. They isolated themselves and they dedicated their lives to the Lord. Okay? They had a person who was a, uh, a leader or a ruler over them, and they had to pledge obe obedience to that leader. And this happens with John the Baptist later on. So when the Dead Sea... Scrolls come Correct, from. where the Dead Sea Scrolls come from. Yeah. That's exactly right. Sorry. That's all right. No, 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 it's good. Good to, good to clear it. So we've got the Zealots. So the Zealots were formed much later than the Sadducees and Pharisees, and the Essenes actually peeled off in between the two. Okay? So the main two parties were always the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Okay. So the outcome of this revolt that we're talking about is actually found in your Bible. So if you go to the book of Acts, chapter 5, Verse 37, you'll find mention of this person that I just talked about who led the revolt. And they're talking about it in hindsight. Okay. So, so again, a Jewish leader called Judas of Galilee, or Judas of Kamala, leads a resistance movement that turns uh, 
against the, the oppressors uh, and, and what happens is they become known as the zealots because they form a fighting army, an independent militia if you will. So Acts 5 verse 37 says, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census. Now to make sense of this scripture you read in the future. Appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. So the outcome of his revolt was he was killed. But from those who scattered, they believed they formed the beginning of the movement called Zealots. Okay, so biblically, this historical account that I'm giving you is, is there. Okay. Now the appointment of Quirinius as governor of Syria tasked with taking the census is also mentioned in the Bible. So if you go to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to be reading a bit from Luke chapter 2 today, uh, verses 1 to 2, uh, so Luke 2 verses 1 to 2, it says, In those days Caesar Augustus, so we have the mention of the Roman emperor, issued a decree, so in other words he's the one who authorised the census, that a census should be taken. And then in brackets a little bit later, it says this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So these separate statements in separate books of the Bible, when we actually put them together in context, we find that the Roman Emperor authorized the census because Herod Archelaus was deposed as corrupt. When they asked for the census, uh, uh, there was going to be a general revolt the high priest at the time, Joazar, actually stopped a full revolt. But this band of merry men, independent militia, we will, formed an army of about 3,000 people and they decided they would revolt against this. This revolt was put down and the put down is actually described in Acts 5 verse 37. In Luke 2 verses 1 to 2, we have the mention that Quirinius was actually ordered by Caesar Augustus to take the census and that it was the first census that was actually taken. Okay, So the Bible's a bit of a detective book sometimes, isn't it? But when we put the pieces together, we can get a broader picture. So this is all going on in this period of time that we're calling the... I'm sorry, yes. Bit of a quiet time, isn't it? There's no narrative about Jesus himself. But what we're doing is we're getting a bit of a picture about what it's like to live at that time. How do you think the Jews picture the Romans at this point in time in the Bible? Like them? Love them? Tolerate them? Hate them? I hated them. Yeah. Remember, they were the fourth beast of Daniel's prophecy. They knew they were coming. Yeah. Right? And it was described as the most onerous of all of the four empires that would take over them. Because they were brutal. Their taxes were heavy. Why? Because they were expanding their kingdom, if you will, their empire, greater than any empire had ever been expanded before. So during this time, and this is going on, they're heading up into what today's Germany, heading across to Britain. They're going in territories they've never, ever expanded before. They've already got France. They've taken over all the nations in between. So they're hungry for money to keep feeding their army. And so their existing empire, they're hitting them hard for taxes. Now, Jerusalem is always a good place to hit for taxes. Why is that? It's right through the Bible. Because of the temple. Because every time someone goes to the temple, what do they do? They pay a tithe. And so there's an accrual of wealth in the temple like no other temple on the earth. And so whenever the coffers are low, go and hit up the temple of Jerusalem for some money. And then we read about this in the Bible again and again and again. Okay, so now moving to AD 9. So AD 9, up here, I've got a note here that says Marcus Ambivalus. I'm sorry, but I have to laugh at some of these names because what does Ambivalus mean? <laughs> Anyone want to describe that word? False. When someone's ambivalent, what are they? Confusing. Confusing, unclear, unclear indecisive, mm. right? So Marcus the indecisive <laughs> is appointed <laughs> the second Roman prefect of Iudea. Okay, so we find that the first Roman prefect who was put in place in AD 6 
is replaced within three years by this new fellow called Marcus Ambivalus. The reason is, is because the prefect Coponius is called back to Rome and he is replaced. Now, um, Marcus Ambivalus is actually a former cavalry officer. So this is his background. What we find, and I'm going to mention this, is that the people who come to rule over Iodea, as it's called, are actually not the most prestigious people. Why do you think that is? How do you think the Romans see the territory of Israel, as we call it today, but all of those lands? Sorry? A big problem. Their problem? Well, so nobody wants to go there. Right. It's yeah, a yeah. backwater. Yeah. Apart from the temple and the cash that it gets, no one really wants to know about it. See, Syria is actually more important because it's a, it's a gateway location through to the east. Right? When you go into uh, the land, God's land, you've got the Jordan River separating it from everything else from the east. So he's a cavalry officer. And the Jewish historian, again, explains this in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews. And he writes, As Coponius, who we were told you was sent along with Cyrenius, that's Quirinius, was exercising his office of procurator or prefect and governing Judea, the following... See, Josephus, he calls it Judea still as well. So biblically, any Jew will call it Judea. Makes sense, right? Because it's the land of the Jews, land of the people of Judah. So the following accidents happen. As the Jews were celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we call the Passover, it was customary for the priests to open the temple gates just after midnight. When therefore those gates were first opened, some of the Samaritans, so this is why the Jews hate the Samaritans, this is another case, some of the Samaritans came privately into Jerusalem and threw about dead men's bodies in the cloisters. So... So in, the, so in the, uh, uh, the outside areas, with the roof over the top of the temple, they, the Samaritans thought, let's just go down to Jerusalem, go to the temple and pop a few dead, de dead bodies around. Well, what does dead bodies mean in the temple? It's defiled. It's defiled, it's desecrated. And so the Samaritans knew this is the worst thing that they could actually do. The story of the Good Samaritan, the parable, I mentioned this one Sunday. When the priest walks across the other side of the road to avoid the Samaritan, the general story gets told in church that how could a man of God leave somebody destitute in the gutter of a road, right? But that's not the reason he went to the other side of the road. Because if you actually read the story, it says that the priests were coming up from Jericho, going up to the Temple of Jerusalem to do their job. If they came into contact with a dead body, yeah. they couldn't go to work. Not just for one day, they were in lockdown. <laughs> Seven days. And so when he crossed over the other side of the road, it's because, not because he was a Samaritan, right? it's because the priest didn't want to be defiled and not be able to go to work. So when they did this, you can imagine what happened. No one's allowed to go to the temple. The whole place would have been cleaned. It's really... It's like COVID-19, isn't it? <laughs> right? Dead body lockdown. So, so this is what was going on. Okay. So on which account the Jews afterward excluded them out of the temple because there was the area in the outer court where the Gentiles could actually come in, if you recall. So they were excluded altogether, which they had not used to do at such festivals. And on other accounts also they watched the temple more carefully than they had formerly done. In other words, they didn't open the doors at midnight and walk away anymore. They probably left a few guards in place. A little after which accident, Coponius returned to Rome and Marcus Ambivius came to be his successor in that government. So in other words, he's laying the blame of that incident in the temple at the foot of the prefect and he was called back home. They sent another one to replace. Okay. So in other words, the Jews are probably saying, well, you Romans aren't very good at security. We're not very happy. All right. Get your act together or we're going to revolt. So you read the story in the New Testament, everything is like a fear thing, isn't it? The Romans are always trying to appease the Jews so they don't revolt. They just want them to go about their business and pay their taxes. But the Jews, because of the laws, God's laws, 
If they don't get their way and they're not allowed to practice their laws, what do they do? They want to fight about it all the way through the New Testament and the Old. And so we see this recurring here. So under the rule of Marcus and Bibulus, the situation in Jerusalem, the territory of Judea and the province of Idoea appears to be one of peace. But there is one historical event of note, and that is that Salome, the sister of King Herod, passes away. So she would be quite elderly, I would imagine, by this time. Uh, so she passes away. The Jewish historian Josephus mentions it again. And he says, under whom Salome, the sister of King Herod, died and left to Julia, which is Caesar's wife, Jamnia, all its toparchy and for sailors in the plain and Archelaus. Now, these are these areas which I had on the map, the grey areas. OK, so uh, there, there were those areas. Uh, excuse me, where was it? Where is a great plantation of palm trees and the fruit is excellent in its kind. So this is Archelaus. That's the territory against the Jordan River that we showed on the map in the grey there. OK. So it's during the rule of Marcus and Bibulus in AD 11 that we read in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. And we're not going to read the full narrative, but Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52, how Jesus visits the temple of Jerusalem at the age of... 12 and a half, I'm going to tell you. The, the Jews won't say halves. They'll just say 12 in the scriptures. But at the age of 12 and a half, and they visit the time of the feast of Passover with his parents when his father Joseph is aged 112. So you may notice the opening picture I had up on the screen. It shows Joseph as an elderly man, Mary as a young but mature woman, and Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. And so when they go to the temple, Joseph is now age 112. Jesus is 12 and a half. So Jesus slaughters an unblemished lamb to be recognized as an adult under the law. And when the feast is finished, Joseph and Mary head home to Nazareth in the Galilee with their relatives and friends only to realize after a day on foot that their son is missing. I still find that incredible. <laughs> you think you'd be doing a head count or... You know, can you just uh, pop in for dinner and let us know you're okay sort of thing. But So Jesus is missing. So when they can't find him, they return to Jerusalem. And after three days, they find him in the temple courts amongst the teachers listening and asking questions. After expressing her concerns, Mary joins her husband, Joseph, and her son, Jesus, to return to Nazareth once again. So again, you can read that in your own time. Luke 2, verses 41 to 52. We have actually covered that in the previous uh Oh, sorry, two lessons prior to this one. So Marcus Ambivalus is succeeded by the third prefect or governor of Idoea in AD 12. So we move now to the next one. Uh, so we've gone 6, 9, 12. So what's that telling us? Seems like the term of the prefect is three years. Okay. It doesn't stay that way though. But in the early days, this is how it works. So his name is Annius Rufus. Uh, again, another interesting name. I won't uh, put any analogies on this one. But he's appointed as the third Roman prefect of Iudaea. Okay. Now this fellow, um, his tenure in office has no incidents whatsoever. But it is during his rule that Caesar Augustus, the, se the second emperor of the Roman Empire, dies to be succeeded by his wife's son, who's called at the time Tiberius Nero. So the Jewish historian Josephus once again writes about this, and he says, after him came Annius Rufus, under whom died Caesar, the second emperor of the Romans, the duration of whose reign was 57 years. So that's a very long ruling king, isn't it? Or dictator in their case, besides six months and two days. But the duration of his life was 77 years, upon whose death Tiberius Nero, his wife Julia's son, succeeded. And so we have a change of emperor. And so I'll flip over onto the next screen as we carry on. So we now move into all of this period of time uh, under Tiberius. Now, Annius Rufus is succeeded by a fellow by the name of Valerius Gratus in AD 15. So once again, another three years. So Valerius Gratus is appointed the fourth Roman prefect 
and he replaces, and this is where things get interesting now, he replaces the high priest Annas or Ananus or Ananias, depending on the biblical version, with a fellow by the name of Ishmael, son of Fabus or Fabi, and he descends from John Hyrcanus the first. Does everyone remember who John Hyrcanus was? He was a king and a high priest. He was a Maccabee. So he was from the family of Maccabees, the Jewish independent king, Hasmonean kingdom as it became known. And so he's actually a direct descendant of that family. Okay. So when Valerius Gratus took office in AD 15 and Annas is the high priest, appointed by Quirinius, the governor of Syria, as the first high priest of the newly formed Roman province in AD 6. So in other words, Annas was actually appointed in AD 6 under the new um, rule of Quirinius. He is deposed and removed from office at the age of 36, but remains a person of great political and social influence, especially since his five sons and son-in-law whose name is, who do you think, Caiaphas, all serve as high priests at one time or another. I don't know if you recall the scriptures, and we will come to this in a moment, but when Jesus is actually persecuted and he gets taken before the Jews, he gets taken to whom first? To Annas and then to Caiaphas. So Annas isn't the high priest at the time, but he has a huge amount of influence because he's the father-in-law of the high priest. And so that's in your Bible. We'll come back to that. Okay. So all these names, we're finding these are all uh, uh, provided in history. Okay. So it is at a time of turbulence in Jewish politics and the role of high priest is contended for by several priestly families. What does that comment tell you straight away? The role of high priest is contended for. What does that tell you about what's going on with the priesthood? Sounds like modern times, right? Yeah, they're not they're not <laughs> seeking God, they're just seeking man. Right, they're not commissioned and anointed and appointed by whom? By God. So in other words, these are political pos positions. And this, of course, happened in the past as well. So you can imagine when Jesus comes along, and he comes against these characters, knowing this, he obviously doesn't have much to, uh, much to respect them for. So the Roman prefect Valerius Gratus appoints a new priest called Ishmael, son of Phabus, who is a descendant of John Hyrcanus. As I said, he's the Maccabean leader and high priest of the former Hasmonean kingdom. So Ishmael ben Fabus doesn't last long, for after only one year, he is substituted with Elezia, the son of Ananus, in AD 16. So in other words, the son of Annas, or Ananus, is now the next one, in 16 AD. So this fellow is replaced already by Eleazar. So within one year, there's been three changes of priests. Okay? So this tells you they're not about the Lord's business. Right? This is very much in the thick of politics. But he, too, only lasts for one year. And in AD 17, the office is given to another fellow by the name of Simon, son of Kemith. So this is another family. So, so far, we've got three families of priests who are vying for positions. Right? So he's replaced in 17 AD uh, by this new fellow. Once again, he, too, only has a tenure of one year. And in AD 18, he is deposed and replaced by Joseph Caiaphas, the son-in-law of Annas, who, unlike those who came before him, will remain in his position for 18 years. Okay, so this is why they call it a turbulent period of Jewish politics. Why? Because the person who heads up the Jews is the high priest. And so we see the high priest has changed several times, every single year after year after year, until Joseph Caiaphas, the son-in-law, comes into place and he stays put. Now, uh, again, the Jewish historian Josephus explains these changes. So I'm going to read from the Antiquities of the Jews. So AD 15, he was now the third emperor and he sent Valerius Gratus to be procurator or prefect of Judea. 
and to succeed Annius Rufus. This man deprived Annas of the high priesthood and appointed Ishmael, the son of Fabi, to be high priest. So there's no story attached to these guys. They don't last long at all. He also deprived him in a little time and ordained Eleazar, the son of Annas, who had been high priest before, to be the high priest. With of which office, when he had held for a year, Gratus deprived him of it and gave the high priesthood to Simon, the son of Chemethus. And when he had possessed that dignity no longer than a year, Joseph Caiaphas was made his successor. When Gratus had done these things, he went back to Rome after he had tarried in Judea 11 years, when Pontius Pilate came as his successor. Okay. So what we have now, we have Caiaphas come into rule and, the, and this last um, governor who was appointed in AD 15, Valerius Gratus. Remember every three years they had a change, but suddenly from AD 15 all the way through to 26 until Pontius Pilate. So in other words, he ruled for 11 years and uh, Joseph Caiaphas will rule for, as a high priest, for 18 years. And so we see a, a difference. That's why they call this this turbulent period. So Pontius Pilate is appointed the fifth Roman prefect of Idoea. So suddenly we're now in the biblical territory, aren't we? We've got Caiaphas, the high priest. We've got Pontius Pilate, who's actually governing this uh, now co-joined state of three separate regions. Um, and we have, an, we have a, um, an understanding of a bit of the background of how they got to be. And of course, the emperor at this time is called Tiberius Caesar. This is a biblical name for him. In the Bible, they call him Tiberius Caesar. He's um, <coughs> got alternate names as well. So presiding over so many changes in the office of high priest, Valerius Gratus is succeeded by Pontius Pilate, as I mentioned in AD 26. Pontius Pilate, what do you think about Pontius Pilate? You think he's a wealthy man? The Bible doesn't tell us much, does it? It doesn't tell us anything about who he is, where he came from, and yet he resides with this power. So he is actually a middle-ranking Roman nobleman who is educated, reasonably wealthy, and well-connected in political and social circles. It is not known, there's no documentation for how he came to be prefect or governor of the province, but it is considered that one of relatively low prestige and perhaps suits his stature as a man ranked lower in society than a senator or army commander. You may notice that word consul keeps coming up. So basically all the governors are people who are very high ranking in Roman society. Right? They're senators, they're consuls, they're army commanders, they're generals, all those sort of things. But going to the sub-province, they're cavalry officers, they're middle ranking men in society and so on. So we see a different level uh, in that case. Okay, so that brings us uh, to the end of this portion. Now we're going to go and have a look at John the Baptist. Now, basically what we're doing here is we've painted you the background for the New Testament. Right? The previous lesson we looked at all of the prophecy, well not all of them, there's over 300, but we looked at a good cluster of prophecies to speak into the purpose for why Jesus was actually sent. Okay, now what happens is we're looking at the background of who all the people are when he actually is sent, which we understand. So now we begin the journey of the story itself in, in, a, in that sort of sense of the fashion. So to begin the story of Jesus, who do we need to look at first? We've already mentioned him. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Right. Family member, cousin, intertwined story. Okay, so before the birth of Jesus, so we're going to go to the book of uh, Luke predominantly now. So to chapter uh, 1 and um, some other chapters as well. But we're just going to be mainly focused on the book of Luke. Um, so before the birth of Jesus, an angel of the Lord appears before Zechariah the priest, who is startled and gripped with fear. The angel says to him in Luke 1, verses 13 to 17. So if you go to verses 13 to 17. He says, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. 
He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Why? The Bible tells us to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So there is the purpose of John the Baptist. So when John is born, his father, Zechariah, is filled with the Holy Spirit and reveals his purpose in Luke 1, verses 76 to 79. If you can jump forward to verses 76 to 79, Luke 1. He says, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. So now when he says he's going to be a prophet, what does that mean? He means he's going to speak the word of the Lord. Right? He's not going to predict anything. It's not about him. Because the Lord is making him a prophet, he has commissioned him to speak on his behalf. So he says, sorry, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Why? To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. So here's the, here's the Christian message of Jesus, right? It's being given to John first. The knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Now, I don't know if you notice this when you're reading the scriptures, but when they talk about salvation in conjunction with it, it always talks about peace. Now, we're not talking about the type of peace where there's a cessation of war. Right? People often look at words and they have a, a, a positive and a negative measure, don't they? You know, if I ask you, I think we've done this in the past, if I ask you what does the word peace mean, a lot of people will say it's the absence of war. No, it's not. Not biblically. But that's what we do, don't we? We say, oh, we're in times of peace. We're in peace times. In other words, there's a cessation of war. But that's not what he's talking about. So what peace is he talking about here? No. Right. The peace comes from salvation. Why? Because you know where you're going right the biblical message obviously gets uh, expanded we talk about jesus dying on the cross how he'll overcome sin how he'll overcome the devil how death won't hold him down that there's eternal life but at this point in time we're talking about salvation and peace because salvation should bring you peace right it means that you don't fear death because you are going to receive salvation right <clears throat> so he always connects the two together so set apart to serve god john grows up in the wilderness just north of the dead sea luke chapter 1 verse 80 explains so luke chapter 1 verse 80 he says and the child grew and became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So there's the answer to my earlier question. He lived in the wilderness as a child. He grew up in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. In other words, there was a time where he was going to be commissioned as well. So both Jesus is alive and John the Baptist is alive. They're growing up through their childhood, but their function of ministry has not yet been commissioned by the Lord. Okay, so John lived outside of normal society and lived off the land. His life is dedicated to God and he is prepared for ministry with the express purpose of preparing people for the coming of the Lord Jesus the Messiah. So it's during this time that John 
is recorded to live amongst the Essenes for a period of two years or just under two years at Qumran located at the northern tip of the Dead Sea. And this of course is what we mentioned, the location where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. So I have a couple of pictures from when we were in Israel. First of all, here it is. Qumran, where the red spot is. It's right at the top of the Dead Sea. Just over here, we have the fords of Jericho and we have the location for Bethany beyond Jordan where the baptism will take place. And just over here behind Jericho is where the Mount of Temptation is. I call it the Biblical Wilderness Triangle. There's a great video about it. Might as well give myself a plug. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is the location for Qumran, so you can picture. It's actually only about 16 kilometers away from Jerusalem. It's a very small country. Okay, so all these places that we talk about in the Bible where these significant events happen, when you jump in a car, it takes you about 20 minutes to drive from one place to the other. You know, maybe two hours walk maximum if you're on foot. It's all flat. Okay, so a couple of pictures. First of all, uh, up on this uh, cliff that I decided to climb, where one of the Dead Sea caves, I took this photo, and basically what you're seeing here, here's the top of the Dead Sea, right here, and you see this... Uh, green zone here. These are all date palm plantations that are still there today. So this is what the actual Essenes harvested back in the day. This is what they grew. This is one of their food sources. When you go up this green zone, basically you're following the Jordan River. So it's just up over here that Bethany beyond Jordan is. You can actually basically see it from this vantage point. So it's not very far away. Turning the other way, looking south, so standing beside the escarpment. In the Bible it calls these mountains, but they're actually not mountains, they're actually a hole in the earth. Right? It's actually a low spot. The Dead Sea is the lowest part of the earth. right? And so this is actually a plain or a plateau in reality, and this is a subduction zone geologically where one plate boundary meets another and it pushes down under the ground. And so here's the Dead Sea over here. So you can see standing here, so I'm not showing you the side because it's all ruins like this. But standing here, you can see there's the top of the Dead Sea as I showed you on the map. Looking the other way, we've got Bethany beyond Jordan where Jesus was baptised. And of course where John the Baptist was baptising people before Jesus went there. Okay. So this gives you a bit of a, a picture. Now, some of you have seen this, but I'm going to pop on a video about the Essenes and John the Baptist just to give you an understanding. This is actually played. When you go to uh, this site in Israel, before you go out onto the site, uh, it is actually a, uh, declared as a national park today. And so you go through a building, they play you a video about the history of what happened there before you actually go onto the site. And in this video, um, you'll notice in writing, because it's not spoken in English, uh, you'll see that it talks about John the Baptist being there for almost two years. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, pop that on.
이곳에는 교회는 주님이 나가지고 원문박에서 보상하기 위하여 모든 주의를 버렸습니다. 그중에는 예루살렘의 제사장도 있습니다. The high priest from Jerusalem. 우리 앞으로 빛이 나들이며 우리의 대적들은 결국 멸망할 것입니다. 그때까지 우리는 여기에 있을 것입니다. 이 거룩한 곳에선 아무도 우리가 하나님을 경미한 곳을 방해하지 않습니다. 공동체의 공주들은 검소하게 생활하며 모든 재산은 공동으로 소유하고 있습니다. 이 척박한 광야에서도 하나님은 우리의 모든 필요를 채워주고 계십니다. 오늘 아침 종료하고 밖에 있을 때 인접한이 검색한 해에서 온 이웃에게서 새로운 소식을 듣게 되었습니다. 괴로움의 명령으로 세례 요한이 참혹한 소용을 당했다는 것이었습니다. 이때만큼 우리 공동체에도 요한이라는 형제가 있었던 기억이 떠올랐습니다. 그런 몇년전 우리 형제가 보자 이곳에 왔었습니다. 우리 공동체의 세대원이 되려면 어깨관 시험을 통과하고 배우가 너무나 무서워해도 동작을 해야 합니다. 이런 수련을 마치고 정신력이 우리 바로 직전에 갑자기 나도 공동체의 맹세를 두고 통화했습니다. 하루에 두 번씩 우리는 깨끗한 법을 통해서 신성한 물로 정결의식을 갖습니다. 정결의식이 일어나면 우리는 다 함께 식사를 합니다. 제자단이 준비한 신성한 밥을 나누고 이어서 포도주를 마십니다. 밤이 되면 우리는 제자들의 소리를 정성스럽게 기억하였습니다. 빛의 자녀는 어둠의 자녀는 모두 하나님께서 창조하신 것입니다. 그러나 빛에 속한 자에게는 하나님의 사랑이, 어둠에 속한 자에게는 하나님의 심판이 있을 것입니다. 오늘 주어진 노동이 끝나고 저녁 식사를 위하여 모든 공동체 문제들이 식당에 모였습니다. 우리 속을 듣는 공부함을 울며 침묵 속에서 식사를 했습니다. 식사가 끝나고 내리어 제사장에게 질문을 할수 있었습니다. 괴로동에게 처형당했던 사람이 혹시 우리 공공체에 있다가 도망한 그 요한이 아닐까요? 그 사람은 다른 사람이 아니요 제사장은 기다렸습니다. 그리고 하나님을 따르는 야대의 형제들은 쓸데없는 생각으로 시간을 낭비하지 말고 성소 공부하나 전념하시오. 제사장은 저를 크게 책망하고 멀쩡 마셔 주었습니다. 사람이 장사해지자 우리는 매일 밤 우리가 해왔던 것처럼 오늘도 밤을 더 성성 공부를 하였습니다. 그러나 저는 이에 관해 아무것도 말해줄 수 없습니다. 우리는 이곳의 비밀을 지킨다고 맹세했습니다. 오직 빛의 아들들만이 야하드 공동체의 비밀을 나눌 수 있습니다. 그러나 모든 비밀은 언젠가 밝혀질 것입니다. 모든 것은 하나님이 예정하신 것이며 우리에게 달린 것이 아닙니다. 음, 여러분 이곳에서 이 말을 듣고 있는 것도 하나님께서 이미 창세전에 계획하신 것입니다. 오늘 당신이 이 신성한 장소에 오게 된 것은 하나님이 미리 계획하신 것이며 그가 원하신다면 우리의 모든 비밀이 당신에게도 드러나게 될 것입니다. 기록 68년 로마군이 지역에 찾아들어오자 야하드 공동체 형들은 그들이 적어놓은 기록들을 하나에 담아 지금 우리 주변에 있는 11개의 동물 속에 숨겨두었습니다. 1900년이 지난 후 1947년 후 군남 무섭 또는 사형사라 불리는 이 각진 둘의 말들이 배준 목동에 의해 우연히 발견되었습니다. 오케이, okay, so what? I know it's another language and you had to read it, but what things of note did you pick up there which actually disagree with the Bible? There were several things that were spoken about there. Free will. Free will is a huge one. They're, now, they're rewriting the scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls is the, the oldest authenticated collection of scriptures in the world. And so, apart from the book of Esther, Everything was there when they found all the scrolls and the canisters up in the caves. They kept on referring to Jahad. Jahad. Why is Jahad? Was that, wouldn't they call it Yahweh? Yes, well, that's a language difference okay. uh, on that. So, several things to note. First of all, it started in 29 AD. 
right? 29 AD is the year that John the Baptist was commissioned. They're talking about him. And it was also the same year that Jesus was baptised by John the Baptist. So it's a significant year. Uh, It also has um, some other significance. I'll just go back to it because uh, it only shows up on that screen here. Okay, so when we get to 29 AD, it actually says that John the Baptist is commissioned by God to, and we're going to come to this in a second, to prepare the way for Jesus in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. I just want to note, the reason it's 29 AD, and it actually agrees with what's said in Israel there, a lot of writings actually disagree with this year as that year. They say it's 28 rather than 29. The fact is, is that when you go back on the previous chart, we start off with this issue of dating, right? So when we look at the dating, we don't have a zero year is one thing that's in here, okay? One of the problems uh, that we experience in dating is that you see that when we have the changes of roles, they talk about periods of reign. So in a Bible, or and with Josephus, the historian, when he talks about a year of rain, he is talking about a full year. Okay? So when we go to the uh, sorry, when we go to the change of the emperor to Tiberius Caesar Augustus, he commences his rule as the third Roman Emperor on the 18th of September. So it's not an exact new year, right? So this is known as an ascension year, so it doesn't get counted. And so when we actually count the years not including this year, and we talk about the 15th year of rain, that means that we're adding 15 on top of 14, and it brings us to 29 AD, or AD 29. That's where we come to those figures from. Okay? So you actually have to understand the dating, and that's part of the problem. So a lot of people write books, contest and argue, and all the rest of it, but they actually understand the way dating is done. So Josephus, he also dates the same way as the Bible. There's ascension years and there's regnal years, okay? So that's why it's 29 AD. But also in this, so we've dated uh, from John the Baptist when it actually happens based on the reign of the uh, emperor from Luke 3 verse 1, which we're going to come to. And then it says, in the spring of the same year, Jesus is baptized. Why spring? I'll come to that soon. But why why in the spring of the year? Uh, The feast. You can align it with feast, but there's a practical reason why in spring. Temperature. Temperature, which leads to? Rain. Rain, which <laughs> leads to? <laughs> Water, which comes from? The, sky. the river and the sky. And when it comes from the river, where does the river come from? Mountains. Mountains. So at the top of Israel, we've got Mount Hermon. We also have the largest spring in the Middle East that provides about a third of the water. We've spoken about this before. right? The other third of the water comes from tributaries which flow into the Jordan River and one third comes from the snow-capped melt from Mount Hermon, which is right next to Syria today. And it's a ski slate. It's a holiday resort in uh, Israel today. And so a third of that snow-capped melt, so what happens to the river? It goes into flood. What happened when the Israelites went to go into the land of Canaan originally, what does the Bible tell us? That the river was in flood. Okay, the river was much bigger in those days. And so the spring time is connected to the harvest season and it's connected to the provision of water. And so if you go into the Jordan River, and there's actually historical cases of people who've been to Bethany beyond Jordan where I've been, and they've actually been drowned because they've been swept away in the river. And that's in today's river. Back then, the river was far, far greater, right? So what happens is, is that we find this story of spring. Jesus is not going into the drink with John the Baptist in the middle of a raging flood. And so it determines what time of the season can be. The other thing is temperature, of course, because the temperature is freezing. So at the time when Jesus was actually crucified, it was actually really, really cold. Jerusalem snows. It wasn't in the peak of winter, but it was in autumn. So it would have been really, really cold. Okay, So so we get some insight into what's happening. And the scriptures also tell us in John 2.20, 
that the Temple of Jerusalem had just been finished in its reconstruction because it says uh, in an argument that they're having with Jesus with the, the Jews, it says that the temple has just been finished after 46 years of reconstruction. Jesus says, I'm going to knock the temple down and rebuild it in three days. They took him literally. But the reference is, because they take it literally, is that the temple was being rebuilt for 46 years. So they can go back historically and see when Herod started building the temple and they can know exactly which year it was in. So we have various pieces of evidence to actually put the date together. Okay. Okay, so the thing is with the Essenes there, we find that John the Baptist was there. We find that they had a principal person, a head. Um, you may notice in the video that he stood up and he said, I wanted to speak during dinner and you're not allowed to speak during dinner. And so he goes with his hand to sit down and he actually discounts what he actually says. He says, oh, isn't that John the Baptist? And he's, and he's like, no, no, we don't want to talk about that. We think about what happened. The Essenes don't believe numerous things, right? They don't believe in a lot of normal things that we believe in. We're talking about eternal life. They don't believe in free will. And so it was a very uh, a strange sect in a, in a sense. But John was there. It says that he left before he finished his two year term. And so where did he go to? He was out and about. He was commissioned by God. Right? He becomes commissioned to do his work. And so this is where we go now. So under the rule of the Roman Emperor Tiberius Augustus in AD 29, John the Baptist hears from God and prepares the way for the long awaited Messiah to be identified, empowered and commissioned for ministry here on earth. Luke 3, so we want to go to Luke 3, verses 1 to 2, identifies the year, the rulers and the priests when God speaks to John and commissions him to prepare the way for the Lord, his very own cousin, Jesus. And so the scripture reads, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, so that's Herod Antipas, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So all those names that we've just been through tonight, they're all in that same paragraph. And so you can see why I've provided that background. Okay, so all there in Luke 3, verses 1 to 2. So the time has come for John to appear, so we're almost finished tonight. The time has come for John to appear publicly to Israel. So Luke 3, verses 3 to 6 explains what he does and quotes the prophet Isaiah from so many years earlier. So it reads, He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. And it reads, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth. And all people will see God's salvation. What does it say? Which people? All people. So we're talking about Jews and Gentiles. So John the Baptist is already preaching a message to the Jews which says it's not just for you, it's for all people. So people listened to John and before long large crowds were coming to Bethany beyond Jordan where he baptised them in water. So we go now to Luke 3 verses 7 to 18 reading on. It reveals what happens. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, <laughs> You wouldn't want to cross John, I don't think. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. So in other words, being Jewish by bloodline is no longer good enough. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, The man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptised. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be a tax collector, really. it's such a stigma. Tax collectors also came. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. So that's what I was mentioning earlier. 
They were corrupt. They were taking some on the side. This is why Matthew had such a hard time. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ or the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals or the laces of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. And so what we get a picture of is here's John out in the wilderness. People are coming from everywhere to hear what he has to say. He's got tax collectors. He's got soldiers. He's got the general population all coming. And so this is where we now switch over to the book of John. Because it's only a matter of time until the Jews or the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the priests, the chief priests, starts hearing about John down here in the wilderness and everybody coming to be baptized by him. So, of course, they're worried about him. So, what do they do? They send priests and Levites to ask him who he is. The testimony of this is found in our last scripture for tonight, John chapter 1, verses 19 to 28. And so this is the last scripture that brings us up to the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he's baptized, which is where we're going to finish. So John 1 verses 19 to 28 says, Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem, or the Jewish leaders, sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ, or I am not the Messiah, depending on your biblical version. It's interesting, isn't it? We're in the New Testament written in Greek, and yet the English translation, you often get Jesus is the Messiah. It really should say Jesus is the Christ, because that's contextual to the language it's written in. So, but either word means the same. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Pretty blasé, hey? They're there in front of him saying, we need to take an answer back to the boss. So they're not screening what they're doing. So John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet. So once again, when people are persecuted in the Bible by those who practice the law, they answer them back with the scriptures that they know. And so he quotes the prophet Isaiah. I am the voice of one calling in the desert or the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. So he identifies himself as that person from the prophet Isaiah. Now some Pharisees who have been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ? Nor Elijah, nor the prophet. I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. So while this is all happening, we revealed here that Jesus is amongst them already. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals. So he says this again, like he said to the soldiers and the tax collectors and so on. I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. This identifies where Jesus was baptized. And of course, I have a small video on this, but I'm only showing you a picture tonight of the same place. Oops, and there it is. And that's what it looks like today. So when I was there with Roger, we were up in a pool up here where we got baptized. This is the Jordanian side. So this is how wide the river is here. Right? So people are on the Jordanian side, people are on the Israeli side, and they're in this pool. But this is the location for where John was baptizing and where Jesus was baptized. So if you actually look at the land uh, higher up, when this is in flood, it goes over all of this and it goes up onto the buildings up at the side. And so this is why Jesus was baptised in the spring, because otherwise uh, they wouldn't have been able to go in there.